we're going to talk about now is we're going to start talking about dimensionality reduction. So that's what I'm hoping to cover if you're following the book at section 7.3, but only the parts on PCA, uh, nothing else really. Um, so uh, dimensionality reduction. And here, um, uh, I, I find it best to start with an example. So suppose, uh, suppose I have a data set that comes from somewhere, and I want to do some machine learning with this data set. And this data set has two attributes. Right? It has, and the attributes are height and ref, whatever ref is. Um, and um, and uh, the, the first question is, every instance has these two numbers. So the question is, how, um, how many dimensions do I have in this data set? And the natural answer would be two. Right? I have two attributes, so it's a two-dimensional data set. Um, and then I start playing around with it in Weka. I start doing, uh, I start doing uh, plots of the various attributes, and I find that, okay, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're numeric. Uh, height is measured in inches. Refu seems to be measured in centimeters. Uh, and they do seem to be highly correlated. But uh, sort of off the top of it, I would still say, okay, two-dimensional data set. Um, and then your friend comes along, and your friend speaks Swahili, and your friend says, well, you know what? Refu is height in Swahili. <laughs> okay. So how many dimensions does your data set have? One. Right? So Because really, the height and the refu are uh, different names for the same thing. And the numbers could be very different, because one's in inches, another one's in centimeters. And you could actually have some variation uh, between them, because maybe one of them was measured in uh, one of them was measured in, a, in an inches speaking country, and another one was measured in um, in some African country, and they had slightly different rulers. So there's some noise in the observations, right? So um, so it's an extreme example, uh, but it's an illustrative example because what it shows is when you look at the data set, you tend to look at, at it on a surface, and you really have no idea what the attributes represent. And until you do know what the attributes represent, you have no idea how many dimensions you have in your data. You could have completely redundant dimensions, like, like in this case. So here's another example. Suppose I have uh, sensors all over. So I'm, I'm, I'm some kind of a monitoring agency, and I'm receiving the data all the time from the different geographical areas. And the kind of things are, uh, that I'm receiving are the number of skidding accidents that they have on the roads, the number of burst pipes, how much money they spend per day on snow plows, uh, how many school closures you've had, how many pen patients had a heat stroke and were taken to the hospital. Right. So all of these seem like completely different attributes. They tell me different things. Things. But if you look at them closely, you'll realize, oh, wait a minute, there is, there is a single factor that could probably explain most of these things, and that is the temperature in that geographical region from, from, from where these data are coming from, right? So, uh, you know, you don't have skidding on the roads unless you have ice, and ice happens when the temperature is below freezing. And when it's below freezing, pipes are going to burst, and you're going to spend a lot of money on, slow, on snow plows, and patients are not going to have heat stroke uh, when it's below freezing, but the schools will close when it's below freezing, right? So, so you have a single factor that could account for lots of these observations. So all of the attributes that you have in your data, they are all dependent on some quantity which you're not observing directly, right? So, and the reason this is important is because when you do your modeling, your models will look at all of these attributes, and they should really be looking at the temperature, because that's going to explain <clears throat> things. OK, great. So um, typically, the data sets that you have in machine learning, almost anything realistic, is going to be high dimensional. So if you're dealing with images, you have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of pixels. Uh, if you're dealing with text, you have millions to billions of words. Um, yeah, and that's at least the way we record them. That's the way we observe the data. That's the way that it comes in to us. Uh, and in truth, the true dimensionality might actually be a lot lower than that. So your data might actually be straddling some low, some low dimensional manifold in high dimensional space. And what you want to do is you want to sort of figure out what that manifold is and use that as your dimensions rather than the original dimensions. So here's a specific example, handwritten digits. Suppose we're doing binary digits, 20 by 20 bitmaps. Uh, in that case, the total number of observations is 
2 to the 400, because we have 400 pixels, each one of them can be 0 or 1, so we have 2 to the 400 possible observations. Now, um, so it's a lot of observations, but you might think that a lot of these observations actually reflect the different ways we could write handwritten digits. Right? Um, and, um, and, uh, and that's what I first thought when I thought about this. Uh, and then I realized that that is completely wrong. So if you look at these 2 to the 400 possible events, they don't look anything like digits, right? So if you take a random one of these events, it won't look like that. It'll look like that. Right? That's a random 20 by 20 bitmap. That's another one, and that's another one, right? So if you take the space and just keep randomly sampling from it, you're not going to get these guys. You're going to get lots and lots of these guys. <laughs> okay. So now, why am I showing this? I'm saying that using the original representation, you are wasting your machine learning algorithms on events that don't look like that don't look anything like what you want to model. Right? These, these, you're never going to get something like that as input to your classification algorithm. Right? Um, so the true dimensionality of digits is not 2 to the 400. The true dimensionality has something to do with pen strokes. It's how much variation do I have in my hand when I am writing a particular digit on paper. It's not you know, how many pixels I can set to 0 and 1. It's really the pen strokes. And the dimensionality of that is much, much lower than, than this. OK. So um, all right. So, so, uh, so I've shown you that most of the data is high dimensional. And the real dimensionality may be a lot lower. But we are doing machine learning. So why is it a problem to have high dimensionality? And the reason it is a problem is because most of the methods that we have are statistical in one way or another. Right. So uh, most of our methods, what they do is they count. They count observations. They count how many positives and negatives, how many examples of each class do they see in various portions of space. Right. So uh, here's an example with decision trees. Uh, the weather, uh, the outlook is rainy, and the wind is strong, and the temperature is about 28 uh, degrees. That defines a, f a portion of your space. Right. That's like a little quadrant in some, in some space defined by your uh, attributes. And the decision tree is going to count how many times John played tennis versus how many times he didn't play tennis in that <coughs> little cube. All right. uh, and in text, you're counting if the email contains HP and 3D and not the dollar sign, you know, how many of those were uh, positive spam, how many of those were non-spam. <clears throat> so, Almost all the methods that we have, they are statistical. They count classes in regions of space. And what's happening is, as the dimensionality of your data grows, your density of observations becomes lower and lower. Right? So here's an example. Suppose I had one dimensional data and uh, one attribute, and this attribute is quantized into sort of low, medium, high. So maybe three values. Right. Um, and, uh, and I have 10 observations across three classes. Right? So here, I do have some observations for each region of the data. And I could construct some sort of a reasonable prediction. Right? So if the value was medium, or if the value was low, then it's very likely to be red, whatever the red class meant. Okay? So that's in 1D. Uh, if I added another attribute, I'm going to have nine regions, if I quantize them in the same way, and, but I still have the same 10 data points, and they're going to be somehow spread out over that space. Right? And now I'm going to have regions of space where I have no observations at all, and they just become sparser and sparser. And if I have uh, three attributes, then I'm going to have 27 of these regions, and I'm still counting the same 10 training examples, now over 27 regions. So most of these are going to be empty. I'm going to have no observations at all. Right. And even if I do get a one observation, I mean, is it, uh, is it enough to make inference, right? So you toss a coin, it comes up heads. Does this mean it always comes up heads? No. Um, so that's why high dimensionality is a problem for machine learning, because your space grows really, really quickly, but the number of examples that you have stays the same. So there is less and less redundancy for your learning algorithm to 
sink its teeth into. So it's going to perform worse and worse.